Um, my name is Jakob Moos. I am uh, leading the sustainability tribe. It's a product tribe. We have a product tribe system at Transporion. Before I did that, I had uh, founded a company called Trax, uh, which, we, uh, which was bought by Transporion in uh, August 22. And uh, this week is a special week for me. I'm very happy that uh, two days ago we, were fi we finalized the integration of the, the Trax product into Transporion's world. So anyone who wants to, to be a customer, you can just give me a call afterwards. So um, you could probably imagine it's really it's a difficult uh, task to get everything done, get this, the company doing. What I want to talk to today, uh, talk about today is this, uh, these problems we have when it comes to freight transport. I will be heavy on road, but because that's the biggest problem. We have some very good people in uh, ocean <laughs> who, who are very far. So uh, I will talk very much on road, but we are uh, multimodal. Um, I'm using this example. I'm a big fan of, uh, of, uh, of Alan McKinnon. He uh, started writing about this back in the days where it wasn't cool, uh, and he still made a career out of it, so good for him. <laughs> um, Alan, uh, like one of the focus points we have when it comes to uh, freight transport and measuring and lowering CO2 emission in freight transport is that for all modes of transport, it's insanely difficult to predict. It's insanely difficult to predict. And that is why we need, we, it's not as easy as other operations in a company to scope three operations in a company to model because you will have an enormous error rate. And I'm going to just dig into it in a second. I'm going to go one step back because I want to give you an overview over what is it we do at Transporion. So Transporion is a platform. It's a transport platform. We've spent the last uh, 22 years building uh, an infrastructure between carriers and shippers, and we define it broadly, like a carrier as anyone who sells transport, ship or anyone who buys transport. And what we, what we build it up on was first allocation of transport, meaning a big company wants to send something from A to B, and our system in the background makes sure that the fleet operator somewhere, let's say in Russia, knows where to pick it up, where to drop it off. That has been the system. After, uh, over the years, we have built many different products around this. We have built many products around this to make sure to, to, to use this data infrastructure between carriers and shippers. And one of these products is uh, the sustainability products that were, were bought and now integrated and now we go live with. So, uh, so this, is, this is sort of uh, just to give an overview over what is Transporian doing. We are not very visible for most customers. We are in the background. They use their own user interfaces where we make sure that it happens. So we have talked a lot about scope three and all of you probably know how insanely difficult it is to measure scope three in many of your uh, operations, uh, upstream, downstream, everything. I'm gonna talk about the freight transport part. The beautiful thing about it is, of course, that the easy scope one to measure uh, for the carrier is the difficult scope three for the shipper. So this data infrastructure, that was the main reason also why I chose to sell my company to Transporium because we've come very far with very, very uh, close cooperation with uh, Smart Freight Center. I also saw tracks was still on your, <laughs> on your slide. Um, but we knew that this infrastructure that uh, Transporian has built is important to solve the problems of our customers. So um, we have this tool called Carbon Visibility that's available for all our customers and also for new customers, so to speak, where we create an automated and precise allocation of CO2 emissions on a shipment level. Uh, it is accredited by Smart Freight Center. We have uh, eight different uh, calculation models on it. Um, but what we also do is we enable you then to do outbound APIs into your own systems again, into your carbon ERPs on a shipment level so that you can disaggregate it down to a product level in the way you want to do it. What's most important with what we do is we do all of this because we want to lower CO2 emissions. So. I uh, have been asked many, many times, why is it so important with primary data? And I'm just gonna give you one example out there about why it's so important, uh, primary consumption data in this case, and then afterwards I'll try to like, jump a little bit quicker through it because I'd rather have a conversation with you guys. But this is sort of, this is sort of um, my extreme example that I like to use. So this is an example where I take one Euro pallet that weighs one ton, and I am told by my shipper customer that I have like ton, kilometer, and mode. We want to transport this one ton, 100 kilometers, and I know nothing else. 
And in that case, I have to default to the worst. That's something I have, uh, I'm, I'm ordered to by my accreditation, so to speak. So thank God that we have uh, an accreditation and auditing there. So I default to the worst. It's a Mercedes-Benz Sprinter that drives through the city. It drives home empty uh, and is really inefficient per ton kilometer. 650 grams per ton kilometer. If it had been, it had been an 18 ton load, then I could default it to a 40 ton truck. That would have been 154 grams of CO2 per ton kilometer. But that's what we call the default. So that's my one example why, because the next thing we do is we model. And the good thing about having a platform like Transporian, we might know the license plate. Uh, we can match it with a license plate. We know it's an uh, EU6 engine, for instance, because we have, we have seen this truck before. We have some different ways of modeling. Uh, we call it rules-based modeling. And we can thereby go down and have the, the average uh, allocation per ton kilometer lower, more precise. But <coughs> where, it gets in oh, where it gets interesting, oh, there. Where it gets interesting is when we can have primary data. We have two calculation models on primary data. The best way of doing it is, of course, when we know the total fuel consumption on the trip of the vehicle. And it doesn't matter if it was a day trip, a month trip, two months is the max. We know the total fuel consumption. So we have 100% amount of CO2. We can calculate it into CO2e. And then we know exactly what was on board the vehicle. So we can do a precise allocation on every single shipment that was on board. That is what we call primary absolute. This is uh, what we do automatically, and we're very, very successful in getting this data from the, uh, from the uh, carriers. We have another one. That's one I say with 64 here. It's because reality is also that we don't always get this extreme uh, primary data. We also get uh, other ways of primary data. So we have a calculation model where we get a snapshot of the data field that, that is called total fuel consumption truck lifetime by pickup and we get a snapshot by drop-off, then we have a delta, and we know exactly how many milliliters of diesel was spent from pickup to drop-off, but we need to model what happened uh, from base to pickup and drop-off to base. So we have these ways of going out and trying to go into the, the, the data funnel as far as we can for every single calculation we do. We really try to make sure that we get closer and closer to reality. And as you can see, a real, this was the extreme. This is more realistic. Uh, that is a negative calculation where we know nothing, and when we know something, it goes down to 54 in this example. I have a, 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 a real example I had with, uh, because it is, has a monetary value, of course. I had a, um, we had a test with a shipper a couple of years ago where we went in and, and, and did three ways of calculating it. So this is 117 FTLs, 117 full truckloads. It's not much. And already there, you can, you can see they drive very far, but still, <laughs> it's not much. And the first one we calculated with the default, they all had around 18 tons on it, so it couldn't be on a, on a van, right? But it was the default. Then we modeled it, and then we went down and used the primary data and saw it was around about 52 grams of CO2 on average data. The reason why it was 52 on average data was they were efficient. They drove on the highway. They, they, they put a trailer on and then put a new one on when they had given it off and so on. So they were extremely efficient. I then translated the CO2 emissions into cost. Which cost should we take? Everyone asked me that. Uh, the funny thing is that many companies have started having an internal cost of CO2 emissions. Often it's around 12 euros. In this case, with the customer, we took the daily price of the futures that we could see on New York Stock Exchange that day. I've changed it now into what it was last week. Uh, 86.63 uh, euros per ton CO2. So we, the only reason why we translate into cost here is because many of our customers are not experts in sustainability. Our customers are, are freight procurement people, and they don't have a relationship to CO2. They have a relationship to money. So I go in and say, no matter how you do it, no matter if you put 86 or you put 12 euros, just calculate how many shipments you have, calculate how much you can. You, it is going to cost you one day, so to speak. So this is the first thing. This is the reason why I get my customers on board, because I give them a lever to lower their measured CO2 emission uh, just by getting more uh, subcontractors on board. But the real reason why we do it, and real reason why this is important, is yes, we have some easy, uh, some quick wins. And they're quick wins 100% uh, in accordance with our agreements with Smart Freight Center, uh, with CDC and everyone else, because we come closer to reality. <coughs> what is really important for us and where we really want to go in and, and play with them is when we then come away from our 400% error rate in like saying what, what happened out there on the road, and we actually go in and have 2 to 5% error rate, 
We can use our predictive analytics and our uh, AI models to actually help them real lower CO2 emission, either by cooperating with their subcontractors in how they can lower CO2 emissions and help them economically, or in better planning or both. So this is where we go in, this is why we do it, and this is where it's really fun. And then, of course, this industry, we, can, we cannot deny it, they are going to have to offset uh, at one point, but it's better to offset here than here. So this is, this is mainly what I wanted to talk about today. I just wanted to give you a little overview about why it is so important to have this infrastructure when we talk about freight transport, tell you that there are many, uh, there are companies out there that are doing it. And of course, everything we do is API first so that you don't have to have to log into a new system. It is going in the background. It feeds into your carbon ERP or your BI tool or wherever you need to do it. And now I would like to ask you if you have some questions. We have five minutes. Yes. So um, I've got a question around um, the, sorry. Sorry, uh, so, so again, it's Anthony with uh, uh, Maersk. And I've got some questions around um, what kind of modeling you've done with um, either bio D, solar, EVs. And so I've done, uh, for a large FMCG client, um, some trials of triangulation in, in UAE, and we're about to do in Singapore as well, using biodiesel. And of course, I know the biodiesel I'm getting is B100, but then once it gets out, you know, and what what is it actually tracking at? And even if you think about EVs, you think that they're you know they're zero, but they're not really zero because it depends on your you know your your energy source, your feed source. So your models over there were based on diesel. Have you done modeling around EVs and biodiesel as well? We function on, on all kinds of energy, any propulsion system. So, so what we do is in our tool that is uh, toward, uh, towards fleet operator and road freight. So we also work on the other modes, but we, we deal differently with them. In our tool towards uh, uh, road freight, they can put in which energy source they have. So an electric truck can say exactly what was their electricity bill and we will then uh, account it. If we don't, we're gonna go default to dirty uh, CO2. So the difference is like we measure, yes, when we want to lower CO2 emission, but what we, what we mainly sell right now is more the accounting part. And the accounting part is not necessarily the, the measurement, so to speak, like the accounting part is mainly to make sure that there is an uh, uh, accredited and um, accounting, sh accounting safe, stamp, uh, stamp safe report for them at the end of the month. But the other point, yes, you're right. We are doing experiments with our customers, both in where, d where should we put in uh, 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 electric vehicles and, and which kind of mix should be the best. And, and, and those measurements you get, can they then be used and audited to get CO2 certificates and that sort of thing? Uh, everything we do in descriptive analytics, sort of like what happened, is always accounting proof. So we get a, a smart freight center uh, accreditation stamp on everything we do. Uh, that also counts for the scope one reports we produce for our carrier customers. Like if they just want to make, or they make scape, scape, uh, scope three that they print to their customers. Um, yes, so, so everything we do is, uh, is always accredited. Our most important part is that our customers, customer need to be able to go to PricewaterhouseCoopers and get a stamp on it. Uh, when it comes to using these data that we learned from, we use the diesel data, like when I'm now, I'm very focused on road freight, my background is in automotive, I can't help myself. Um, uh, the thing we found out was that energy is energy, and a, a truck is a box, and it drives uh, through the wind. So when we measure what's the energy consumption there, we can go in and use that as a model for what would happen with electric. So we become quite good at going in and doing prescriptive analytics if we have, we had a couple of years ago, uh, a, a fast moving consumer good com uh, customer, that said we want to spend uh, money on five electric vehicles, who of, our, um, who of our subcontractors should we support? And we could ask, answer them right away, where would it be efficient enough, where would the driver style be, be fair enough to do it? And then we could give them the prediction of how much CO2, uh, like what is the return on investment in terms of CO2 emissions? So, I'm standing between you and your drinks. <laughs> I know the feeling. But the only thing I wanted to, like, I wanted to say, like, I, I really, really like being in an event like this because I'm usually going to very uh, transport and logistic heavy events. <laughs> so it's very funny to talk the other way around. I don't have to tell anyone about scope three, but I have to tell <laughs> about the transport part. The, mi the biggest and most important message here is, yes, it is a huge part. It's 10% as you just saw, the freight transport part. And we are driving blind. And there is just this, like, there is, 
there are possibilities out there. Start doing a rough measurement. Over the time, you can get your data better and better, and you will come to a point where you can start making decisions. But don't make decisions with 400% error rate. Don't say that we can just put everything, it's gonna be electric in four years anyway, we can put everything on the railway, because that's not gonna happen. You're gonna go the other way around. Start measuring, then lower, and then at the end you have to offset. So, it was a pleasure, have a good drink. <laughs> See you.